our life. Is something else? We, we, we're getting a hum. Do you hear it? It's, it's gone. The coffee. Is that it? Yeah. We are live. We are live. All right. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. And uh, welcome to this February 21st, 2024 meeting of the New York Commission, New York State Commission on Ethics and Lobbying in Government. I'd like to call this meeting to order, and I'd like for our executive director, Mr. <coughs> Sanford Berlin, to declare that we have a quorum and any other information that will make this a legitimate meeting. Good morning, Chair Davey. Thank you. Uh, this meeting is being held pursuant to and in accordance with the provisions of the state's open meetings law, uh, as well as section 94 of the executive law. The conference room that we're using here at the commission's offices in Albany at 540 Broadway, uh, as well as a conference room in our offices at 25 Beaver Street in Manhattan are open to the public during public session. Uh, and public session is also being live streamed and the link can be found on our website at ethics.ny. Uh, and at this time, uh, I can say that a quorum is present. Excellent. Thank you. Um, can we have a motion to approve the minutes of the public session from the January 24, 2024 meeting? Is there such a motion to approve those minutes? I move. Um, Commissioner Cardozo, is there a second? Commissioner Ayers, are there any corrections or additions to, not additions, are there any corrections or revisions to these minutes? Um, I sent a couple by email. Sure. But not for the public session. Oh, great. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Any, anything else? Uh, so we have a motion on the floor. Are we ready to vote? All those in favor of approving the minutes as we have them, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, <coughs> no. Ayes have it. Motion carries. We'll now go to report from staff and Mr. Berlin. Thank you. Uh, the operations update is under tab B in the agenda book. Uh, as we've been doing, in uh, addition to relevant activity figures for the preceding month, uh, also for the month prior to that, as well as the year to date before that. Uh, and those are in columns one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, let me just briefly note a couple of things. Um, investigations, page one in, in the report. Uh, you'll see that we received a total of uh, 13 tips, complaints, and referrals in January. Uh, and a total of 13 matters uh, were closed. We are now, uh, we have not been doing this previously, uh, listing the number of <coughs> continued matters, that is matters carried over from the prior agency uh, that were closed during the reporting period, as well as the number of matters closed uh, since the inception of, uh, of this agency. So we're reporting those separately. So. Uh, commissioners and the public can can see how staff is working their way through the caseload. Uh, I want to point out that uh, there are now, uh, as of as of the end of January, 148 pending matters uh, and 42 open investigations. That compares with at the end of December, at the end of last year, 147 uh, pending matters and 43 open investigations. And, and the reason for that apparent disparity, net net, it's the same, 13 uh, open, 13 closed. But 12 of the closed matters were pending matters last time, one was an open matter. And so the numbers have shifted a little bit. Uh, but, but net net totals uh, come out the same. Uh, in uh, ethics, yes. In doing, going through this, could you let us know where we are in terms of hiring and vacant st staff? Are we now? roughly at comparable in terms of staff? Um, uh, or we, we're not, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. Fine, I just uh, did. But we are, we, are, we are well on our way to completing the, uh, the staffing plan, but we're, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, ethics, uh, on the next page, page two, uh, 77 requests uh, for guidance, and they're broken down on the chart if anyone has any questions. Uh, Keith uh, or Michael Sander, Director of Ethics, can address those questions. It, it, it reflects essentially normal activity. Uh, next page is lobbying. Again, uh, normal activity uh, given the time of year. 
uh, you'll see because we're in the second year of biennial period, uh, the numbers pick up. At the start of a biennial period, we get new registrations, and over the succeeding year, we're just in the, in the middle uh, of that period, the numbers accumulate. Uh, any questions? Uh, Carol Quinn is here, our director of, of lobbying, to answer any questions anyone may have about the statistics. Um, FDS group, uh, page four. Uh, again, normal activity. The fluctuations you see uh, are, the, are the result of uh, the way the academic filings come in, for example. Those are due in November. Uh, so notices of uh, uh, failure to file uh, are, are issued in the succeeding month or two. Uh, and then there's a period of time while we press for the group presses for compliance from those who have not filed. Curious. Um, so there were 2,600 plus uh, failure to file notices sent in December, assuming most of those have to do with academic issues. Correct. Out of out of a pool of how many does that 2,600 number mm -hmm. represent? On the academic filers? Only the academic filers. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the total number of filers we're dealing with is uh, about 34,000, a little bit south of that at, at the present time. Mm -hmm. Uh, do we have that number? Melinda? Okay. Melinda? Good morning, I'm here. Uh, approximately, there's approximately 5,000 academic filers every year. Okay, so we've got half of them that we had to essentially send notices to. I don't know if that's representative of all just academic, though. Is it, Melinda, the 2,600 notices of failure to file issued in December? Is that all filers or just academic? Uh, it's a combination. What it is, is it's a combination of academic filers and uh, required filers that meet the requirement after the statutory May 15th deadline. So it is kind of a mixed pool. Any idea how many, what percentage of that would be academic filers? Just curious. I would say three quarters of that number is academics. Got it. Okay. And, and I should and, and I should introduce Melinda. Melinda Funk is our deputy director of financial disclosure statements, uh, and runs that part of the of the operation. Uh, we are going to going forward be supplying the commission with a breakdown okay. uh, of the non-filing group, so you can see what institutions uh, are generating. Right. Um, frankly, more work for the group sure. in, in doing the follow-up. But I assume that most of those people come into compliance and actually file then eventually, or are we after them for an entire academic year? Most of the times, with the assistance of the agency, we do get compliance. This year has been a tough year being short-staffed, with really only two of us doing the work of four. But with mm -hmm. the issuance of the June failed the files, which we had over 4,800, I ended up <clears throat> issuing 74 notices of delinquency between December and February to wrap up that year. And now I'm working on wrapping up the remaining and just issued another 37 notices of delinquency yesterday. Right. And that would be for right. failed the files in December. Okay. So the general sense, though, is uh, <laughs> like the cat, too. But the, but the general sense she is... She knew that would happen. Right. right. <laughs> you're trying to distract me, but you're not going to get me off my line of question. <laughs> but the general sense is that the people, these folks eventually come into compliance. Correct. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I, I should add, we do have, we, we certainly have enforcement powers if, if there are failures to file. Right. But, but sooner or later, everyone uh, bites the bullet and, and they make the disclosure and they're in the system. But right. but it does it does take a lot of effort. And as we've discussed previously, we are restaffing the group. Uh, we had some uh, key losses sure. uh, over the past year. Uh, but Melinda's doing a terrific job of catching up. Great. With, with Thank, all you. Of that. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Unless there are any other questions, thank you, thank you, Melinda. Unless there are any further questions on the FDS uh, figures on training, I do have an update. Uh, one thing I should point out is uh, earlier this month, February 6th, I think was the date, uh, we rolled out, started a, 
uh, a, new, a new vehicle for agency ethics officers to enter their data um, into our system directly so we can track uh, the numbers of individuals coming in. It's taking a little bit of time for everybody to become accustomed to that system. Uh, and it will become more sophisticated uh, later in the year, uh, by mid-year, uh, is our target when, when the full system uh, is in place. And we've uh, introduced more automation to the process of monitoring uh, and tracking compliance with the, the, the now universal training requirement. Remember, we've gone from training 30,000 some odd FDS filers every three years to training 330,000 uh, individuals, everyone in the executive uh, branch of government every year. So it's a big step up. Michael, Commissioner Cardozo. Um, at the last meeting, uh, Com Commissioner Edwards asked whether we been able to determine whether this increased training that we've succeeded in, in implementing has had an impact on questions that have been asked or failures to file and things like that. Do we have any judgment? I think that's I'm paraphrasing you. I, 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 the, the group is looking at uh, metrics. We have here Megan Hennigan, who is our deputy director for education, uh, who specifically is targeting. So. Um, about a week or two ago, I just took a small group of ethics officers of some of the bigger agencies, mm -hmm. emailed them and said, can you give us our obs an observation of if you've been following? A few of them said yes, definitely more um, uh, guidance requests within their agency because you know we only get a certain amount, but all the ethics officers are doing so many more trainings than we can physically do. So. Um, we are about to, uh, Marlena and I, uh, my co-deputy uh, director, we're about to send out a survey to get everyone, and we're going to ask a whole bunch of different questions, Great. including, you know, have you had more internal um, enforcement actions, things like that. So we are about to do that. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, but bear in mind, we, we do get guidance requests, and Any, anyone uh, in the state workforce can call in. Those who are required to come to us are policymakers, uh, agency heads, statewide. Uh, elected officials. So we're only seeing, as Megan was pointing out, uh, in a mandatory way, those who are required to come to us. But the agency ethics officers, and bear in mind there are almost 400 agencies in the executive branch, uh, they they do the brunt of the work. Uh, and in fact, most of those who come to us first have to go to the agencies uh, for, for guidance. I just wanted to point out that uh, in the chart on the work number of work force members who receive live agency training, the number has ticked up as, as more data comes in. So uh, the chart had indicated 1,372 individuals had live training. It's now up to 2,502. And we still have quite a few agencies left to report their January figures. And, and as everyone becomes accustomed to the system, we'll, we'll have more prompt report, reporting. And Commissioner Groenwegen. I'm sorry. Go I just have one question. Um, listening to what uh, um, Megan was saying about the questionnaire, is that something you're doing uh, with the input from the Education Committee? Since I know they're interested in looking at the questionnaire. Yeah, we were scheduled to meet uh, before this meeting. Oh, okay. And that didn't work out for a lot of reasons. But but the committee will be yeah, working with this is out, This is being done in coordination with, That's with the committee. Right. That's Thank one you. of the commi yeah. committee's uh, missions is to look at the question of, of measuring the impact right. and the efficacy of, of the ethics. Right, training. and I thought, yeah, I just want to make sure that Thank you. Okay, and I, I should point out as well that, that, that our training group uh, has increased the number of trainings they're doing uh, as well, uh, supplementing the work that's being done in the agencies by their trainers and, and their ethics officers. And just uh, by way of reminder, our goal is to have half of the workforce trained. trained live every year. Correct. And and half receiving training. refresher training, training, which uh, is it can be done on demand. And the on demand right. vehicle was launched in November. Uh, and you're seeing the numbers here. So for uh, for January, and that's kind of a live number, uh, over 3,500 individuals took that. But we, d we did achieve, uh, as of the end of last year, uh, more than half of the workforce had received live ethics training, so we've hit that number. But we've got to we've got to keep that up. Uh, if you look at the can, we have to be training live between 13 and 14 thousand individuals a month to keep up 
uh, with a number and a comparable number every month uh, for refresher training. Uh, and, and the goal is to have this system working uh, and everybody in compliance by the end of 2025. Uh, but we've made a good start and we're well on the way, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And again, it's not just us, it's it's the hundreds of ethics officers sure. uh, in training, and tra ethics trainers in the agencies. Sure. And, and then on the lobbying training, what's the total annual number there generally, just in the ballpark? Um, I think it was like eight, like over 8,000, oh. but it was, Last I checked, which was probably a couple of weeks ago, we were at about 83% of the clients and lobbyists, the people who were supposed to be required to take the training. Right. Uh, about 83% had done so. Okay. That's kind of as high as we've gotten, and that seems to be remaining steady, okay. which is why we have the, you know, on our legislative agenda, hopefully to get some enforcement capability, some, some penalty uh, mm -hmm. authority to make it up to 100%. Cool. Okay. Because we, they get reminders, you know, we're reminding them. Right. It's not that we're not telling them that sure. they're delinquent. It's just. They just need a little more incentive. Yes. Yeah. But, but that, you know, that's another 12,000 individuals. And right. we have the lobbyists and the clients. Right. Together, and the number grows through. As, as the biennial period progresses, more mm -hmm. people come into the system who, who require training. Uh, and one of the proposals is to uh, have, the, have the training cycle correspond to the biennial registration period. That would make much more sense cool. okay. every two years instead of every three. I don't okay. even know why, you know, three is in the statute, the Loving Act. I'm not sure really why sure. Um, because it's a biennial registration um, cycle. So it really makes sense to have it every biennial. Okay. And is that one of the, we'll get into this, I know, but is that one of the sort of changes you propose for us? Well, that would have to be a legislative change. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, sure. I just, sure. want, I just sure. want to make one more point, and Sandy uh, sort of alluded to this, but um, the numbers definitely usually end up being for live training around ten to 11,000 every month, and I just didn't want you all to think that why is it low this month. It, they kind of roll in throughout, so right. that, it usually ends up being around that number. Okay. Yeah, you. again, when, what, once we have... The, the more robust system in place, uh, all of this will be automated. And the numbers uh, will automatically populate each month, so we'll have more more current figures. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to having that. And I know the group is very much looking forward to having that. But we'll, we'll be much closer to real time. Uh, unless there are any other questions, next page, page six, audit and review. Uh, you'll see there's a kind of steady state. The group is doing uh, random audits of the lobbying filings of one kind or another, as well as random reviews and targeted reviews of FDS filings. Uh, and there's kind of a steady state uh, that, that the group achieves. And the numbers go up and down in different categories uh, as the periods move forward, but the totals will come out to about the same figure. Uh, and they're, they're hitting those targets that we're reporting on an annual basis. Uh, and doing so very, very well. Uh, and we we do have plans for augmenting that group as well. And the f unless there are any questions, the final... So what's, uh, the, question, what's yeah. the criteria used to um, to select randomly? Uh, it is done using an algorithm that, that we don't control. Okay. It's it's done by an independent uh, uh, accounting group that, that makes those selections randomly each year, both both for the lobbying registrations and other filings that, that are done and for the financial disclosure statements. So it's a randomized process we have no input into. And I assume mean that the number is less than 1% of the, uh, of the uh, application submitted. We, we're doing about 800 on uh, it's 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 over 200 on the FDS side, over 200 targeted audits, and I think another is it 800 uh, on the on the random side, out of about 32,000, 34. It fluctuates between 32,000 and 34,000, so it's a somewhat higher percentage than than that. Uh, and we've, we've looked at the question of whether we can do more, whether there are ways of auditing. We, you know, we, we, we are confined by the parameters of both budget and by the law in terms of the random selections. 
more questions more. Uh, and then public information office uh, which now handles our uh, freedom of information law requests uh, see numbers have picked up again those fluctuate uh, over a period of time uh, but uh, Emily DeSantis, our director of, of many things, including public information and public policy, uh, is also a records access officer and is doing a phenomenal job in keeping these things moving. Have we noticed yet the impact of putting more material on the website so people don't have to make a records request to us? Or is um, that too early not, to sell? Not yet, but we did um, just put all of our 166 records for 2022. Um, because the files are so large, we can't put them right on the website, but we now say they're available and email us and we'll provide you access on a SharePoint so folks can peruse them. We have not yet received any requests for those as of yet. But, um, Remind us what the 166 records are. 166 forms are required by the executive law, a special provision that, that requires that appearances before 11 specified agencies. Uh, are required to be reported on a form indicating whether it's lobbying activity, uh, a regulatory appearance of some kind. Uh, we specify the form. Uh, the forms are retained by the those 11 agencies and they send us copies uh, of those forms. Uh, and right. we, we and or they can make them available to the public. Right. Uh, his, historically, <coughs> uh, the Ethics Commission has made those available on request, uh, Emily has done a lot of work uh, working with outside vendors to, to digitize the information uh, and put it up on the website. It's a big, big project. Right. All right. Anything else here? All right. And uh, the budget update, if, unless there are any other questions on the operations report. Tab C. Tab C is where we stand to date. We, we, we are progressing just uh, as we expected. We're not going to use uh, all of our personal services budget. Uh, we are going to exceed our non-personal services budget, so we'll be moving money over to cover those expenses. Uh, but we're moving along uh, pretty much as we projected. We heard any input as to what's going to happen next year? <coughs> Silence uh, golden in this respect. Uh, well, if, if you go to the next tab, you'll see that, uh, and, and commissioners had, had seen the, uh, the draft before yeah. it went in. It was yes. essentially file, final at that point. It went in the next day. Uh, but the testimony went in uh, uh, happily. Uh, a number of uh, watchdog groups, the government groups, uh, did send a letter in to the legislature supporting our budget. Uh, as allocated by the governor, as well as uh, the budget uh, request that had been made by the Commission on Judicial Conduct. Right. And that one has been rejected, for the Commission on Judicial Conduct, as I understand it. But that's nothing to do with us. That that, that doesn't affect us, uh, but the good government group supported both our request and theirs in our allocation. Uh, uh, they, they also uh, made suggestions with respect to how our budget is determined in the future. They had a couple of suggestions in their submission. Uh, one was either a fixed percentage of some index, uh, maybe some other referent agency to use or percentage of the budget, uh, or simply granting um, whatever request we make in chief. I think that probably applied more to uh, the Commission on Judicial Conduct, uh, where there was a little bit of a question about that. But I think that's going to be resolved. Who recommended, please? The, the, these are the, the, the watchdog groups. Oh, the watchdog groups. Oh. Yeah. And how was it received? Uh, they copied us on their submission to yeah, the... Yeah, we talked about that in one of our sessions with mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. That's great. At the round table. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that, was, uh, that was a very positive development. And, and again, uh, uh, the, the governor's proposed budget uh, allocated the additional amount we requested with, with a question of about another 135000 above that. Uh, I should add that although they're giving us more uh, in the proposed budget on the, on the personal services side, did not increase the amount uh, allocated for non-personal services. 
uh, and again, we can move money from one category to the other. Uh, but it's, at some point, it's going to become an issue that we'll have to address. Not not for this year, as, as I've mentioned, and, and actually the, the, the watchdog groups pointed this out. Uh, going forward, not this year, next year, uh, for the FDS group, we want to upgrade their systems. We are upgrading the case management system that the investigation and enforcement group uses. So we'll need additional NPS to cover the running costs for that. We have enough for the for the initial installation of it in the first year of operations, but we'll need more money uh, for that in subsequent years. That's a future budgetary issue. Uh, and there are other systems we want to upgrade. Uh, starting to look at, we just upgraded the software that the uh, audit group uses, but we'll want to go, I think, to perhaps more sophisticated systems in the future. Questions or comments on anything we've heard so far? All right. Um, nothing else on the proposed budget then? Commissioner per diems? Okay, we, there were no uh, additional per diems paid in January. We are anticipating uh, per diem payments to be made in the current month before the end of February or the beginning of March. And I can, I can read those figures okay. into the record, the total. Uh, it's just over $19,000. It's $19,107.62. Uh, it includes uh, the November Administrative Committee meeting, the Commission um, meetings in August and September, as well as uh, certain preparation time that commissioners have submitted. Uh, and it breaks out as follows. Uh, for Chair Davey, uh, the projected amount is $2,684.01. For Vice Chair Austin, it's $1,725.44. For Commissioner Ayers, it's $1,981.06. For Commissioner Caraballo, uh, it's the same figure, $1,981.06. Uh, Commissioner Cardozo is the same figure. Commissioner Edwards is $3,450.87. Commissioner Gronwagen is $2,620.11. Commissioner James is $1,949.10. Uh, and former Commissioner Whittingham uh, is $734.91. And again, the total is $19,107.62. Questions, comments? Already? And uh, tab, e, tab E in the book uh, contains a news release that uh, uh, our information office issued uh, several weeks ago listing our 2023, the Commission's 2023 accomplishments. Uh, and we, we discussed these figures at the prior meeting, but I, but I, but I do think they're impressive. Yeah, I agree. Uh, notwithstanding the challenges right. we've faced, uh, short staffing at the beginning of the period, increasing through the period, uh, again, we're not fully there uh, quite a bit. I, I just think we should add a compliment to uh, Emily and her, her staff that we're much more proactive in this respect than we had been, and I think it's having a, a positive long-term effect at the same time. So keep up the... Of course, we'll keep up the good work, and then you, it's your job to the public. Right, right. <laughs> here, here. I, 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 I would second that, and I would also add that it's a key part of our mission, uh, because if, <laughs> if, if we're not informing the public, we really can't right. accomplish the mission of, of fostering greater public confidence uh, in government, and frankly, that, that we're doing the job that, that we're charged with. And doing. I would say for, for those of us on social media, we can also drive traffic to the ethics site and post some of this stuff on our own. By liking yeah. those posts. By liking those posts, indeed. Uh, both in LinkedIn and, and uh, Facebook X. and X, right. And we're on Instagram now as well. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, I'll find you on Instagram. But that interferes my, with my daughter's posts. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to do that. You know, I'll just put lots of pictures of Commissioner Cardozo on those posts, <laughs> and then she can. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no. but, but, but the credit goes uh, 
<clears throat> in, in addition to uh, Republic Information Officer and, and her really superb group, who's just done a phenomenal job, but to everyone in the agency for the extraordinary work they're doing uh, and, and have done uh, to, do, uh, to do the work that, that they're called upon to do and to do it well. It's a lot. It's yeah. a lot. It's been, you know, expanded training requirement uh, alone is a huge undertaking. Uh, but everything else that's being done is just being done extraordinarily well. I'm very proud sure. of our staff and well, of our commissioners for your support. Well, thanks to you and the staff. Uh, and it's nice to have good data to report. So thank you all. And that's all I all have right. on the operations side. So I think we're probably ready to go into executive session, unless anybody has any more questions. And uh, just so whoever is watching out there will know that we'll come back with a number of things that we have to pick up in the public session. But for now. Well, um, let me point out one, one sure. thing. We, uh, to, to Ms. Commissioner Cardozo's point, uh, we are actively recruiting for a number of positions at this time. And, and I commend the public to the website uh, where we are listing positions, as well as New York jobs. Uh, if there's interest, uh, I hope there is in coming to work for us right. and with us. Great. Thank you. All righty. So is there a motion to enter into executive session pursuant to public officer's law section 105 and executive law section 94 subsection 11 to address matters concerning employment of personnel pending litigation and investigative and enforcement matter that is confidential pursuant to section 94 of the executive law. Is there such a motion? Commissioner uh, Edwards. Is there a second? Commissioner James. Ready to vote. All those in favor of adjourning to executive session, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. And we are adjourned to executive session and we'll be back uh, hopefully in a couple hours uh, for the, uh, maybe more than a couple hours for the public session. Welcome back to the uh, public session of our um, February 21 meeting of the New York State Commission on Ethics and Lobbying in Government. Uh, we'll ask our Executive Director, Sanford Berlin, for a readout from the Executive Session. Thank you, Chair Davey. Uh, in Executive Session, the Commission discussed matters related to litigation and legal advice. The Commission discussed matters related to uh, pr procedures involving personnel matters. The Commission addressed legal advice related to guidance matters and legislation. The Commission authorized steps in three investigative matters, closed four continued matters, closed ten colleague matters, uh, and discussed several other investigative matters. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to turn to Commissioner Ayers for a report on our comprehensive review of rules, regs, and other um, guiding yeah. uh, <laughs> documents, etc. Thanks. So I just wanted to say briefly, um, all the commissioners now should have received by email the staff draft proposal, which describes a way of going forward with the comprehensive review. Um, I think it's really good. I think it's, it's very thoughtful. I had circulated a proposal of my own earlier. Um, but I encourage everybody to consider that. I mean, you're welcome to read it if you can find it, but it's no longer the operative proposal. The staff proposal is the operative proposal. And if I understand uh, the chair's plan correctly, the idea is that everybody now, you, you have it, so we have a month to take a look at it, to think about it. And at our next full commission meeting, um, we'll take that up and have a discussion. My, my strong hope is that we can vote to approve that process and to get started at the next um, commission meeting. So. Um, I'm hoping that everybody will take some time to read that over the next week or two. And if you have thoughts or concerns, circulate them to all of us by email um, so that um, Sandy and staff can have some time to think about that and react. But a lot of work and thought went into that um, proposal, which I'm really grateful for. And I, I hope that we can um, move the process forward by, by voting to approve that proposal at the next meeting. I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Sandy, but. Uh, no, the, the, the only thing uh, one of the commissioners had um, raised a question about it. Uh, th that proposal, if it's accepted by the by the commission at the next meeting, would entail pushing back uh, our annual meeting to probably the fourth quarter uh, or late in the third quarter of the year, rather than in the first quarter, which which we had previously discussed. And that it'll, it'll be a more efficient way 
of, of doing that, and it'll avoid some of the duplication we might otherwise have in advancing our legislative agenda. And more substantive, I think, feedback as well. And, and more substantive. Based on what comes out of the review. So it would be the fourth quarter of the next, the following year? Of this, of this, of this year. year, of this year. So we're, so we're looking at uh, September, October, more likely. Which uh, means we'll third be in fourth. the second quarter of the new year. New fiscal year. Of the fiscal year. Right. So if it's the fiscal year, it would be the third quarter. So like so October, the November. Year. Yeah, we we're, we're talking about the fourth yeah, calendar quarter, October-ish, maybe September, yeah. Yeah, October -ish. depending on how far we can get in the in the process. Okay. Oh, we'll talk about that, right? You want to talk about that now or later? Well, we we thought we would talk about it at, at, the, at, the, at the next meeting, okay. but I'm happy to talk about it now if there's That's time. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, so we're good with we're okay there. All right. I'll ask everybody to do the reading and and get the comments going. Right. And. Uh, Juice it up. Right. Can you resend it? Sure. And you're saying don't no longer look at your proposal, look at staff proposal. It's what Sandy yeah. sent. Yeah. 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 Sandy sent it the night before. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Sandy sent it on Sunday five I will I will dig it up right now and forward it along. And I'll remind commissioners we are we are in public session. Um, Commissioner Cardozo, did you have anything on the legislative process that you wanted to talk about? No, I think I already alluded to where we stand on the, the lobbying issues, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the, our committee will keep on top of what's okay. going on. All right. Now, in that regard, yeah, I'm no, sure. sure. Um, I'm going to ask Commissioner Groenwegen. Um, yes, and, and I, I, I may ask the uh, parliamentarian for a little advice, but I, I think I want to make a motion to rescind. Reconsider. Reconsider. A uh, motion made at the last open meeting that was a motion by Commissioner Cardozo and seconded by Vice Chair Austin to have individual commissioners reach out to external organizations that have an interest in our legislative agenda and urge their support. So that would be a motion to reconsider the vote. Yes, yes. The vote on that motion is carried by uh, 7 to 1 with Commissioner Caraballo and the abstaining based upon lack of information. Okay, and so you you are putting a motion to the motion on the floor. Right. Yes. Yeah, the motion on the floor yeah, is to okay. the motion on the floor is to reconsider. Is there a second to that motion? Commissioner Edwards abstained. Okay, uh, Commissioner Edwards has seconded the motion. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. If I may, yeah. Wait, 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 wait. wait. We have a motion, is that the motion on the was, floor. Was stated the motion no. is to reconsider. reconsider. The motion should be made and can only be made by members who voted, voted in, in the, the affirmative, affirmative. Yes. At last month's right. meeting. Right, and that was Commissioner Groenwegen. But, but Co Commissioner Com Edwards cannot second. No, it. Right. She said I, I, I abstained. I did not abstain. Okay. So I want to make the record clear. Oh, I voted yeah. in the you negative, and Commissioner okay. Edwards abstained. Okay. Okay. Well, yes. She was correcting the minutes. So that I yes. see. Uh -huh. So is there a second to Commissioner Grown Wiggins? Commissioner James. All right. So all those in favor of reconsidering, please say aye. 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 All those opposed. Now, the motion on the floor is the original motion. So all those in favor of authorizing commissioners to engage stakeholders around the legislative agenda, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. No. Being no. those have it, the motion is defeated. Is there any other business to come before this body? Oh, God, I don't remember. Um, yes. Uh, sure. My motion right. is to... Uh, to... Um, direct commissioners to not engage in outreach to outside parties to promote our legislative agenda without either a request from staff or the approval of the full commission. Yes. yes. Is there a second to that? Second. Commissioner Cardozo. Is there any more discussion on that one? All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. Um, one, uh, one no. Uh, any abstentions? All right, the motion carries. Is there any other business to come before this body? Is there a motion to adjourn? 
Uh, Commissioner Ayers, second Commissioner Cardozo. All those in favor, please say aye. Opposed, no. The mission, it, the mission, the, me, the mission may be adjourned too, at least for the moment, but the meeting is adjourned. I'm in the commission. And thank you all.